more frequent than ours. Yes. Yeah, we had the uh, was it the Tennessee Unity that did a really good presentation about two three months ago. Yep, yep. Tennessee, oh, North yeah. Carolina, South Carolina had a great one from up in Washington. So, hey Dan. Hi. Just getting my presentation up and running here. Hey, and I just made you a call so you can run it. Good to hear you, Dan. Hi there, Brent. How you doing, Bill? How are you? Just fine. Good stuff. There he is. Always good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. How's the snow your way? Yeah, getting a little snowed in here, but uh, we're doing all right. Holy look at our, <laughs> look at, we got our first good snowfall of the year here in Ann Arbor. <clears throat> I had about six to eight inches here a day about mm. two weeks ago. Yeah, we're right across the lake from here, just in, 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 in Ontario. Yeah, we're getting it. Getting ready for another round. Huh. Yeah. It gave me a chance to try out my new ego snowblower. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Electric ones. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. How'd it work for you? Oh, it works great, man. It beats the heck out of the little one stage Toro that I've been babying along for the past last 12 years. Is it corded or cordless? It's cordless. It, it takes two 56 volt, seven and a half hour, seven and a half, half hour batteries. Oh, okay. That's cool. It's got a I've got a quick, a quick charger that'll charge both batteries in parallel in, in a few hours. Very nice. That's good stuff. You know, uh, here in uh, Chatsworth, we were getting a lot of attention a week or two ago about one of the sinkholes that opened up in a road very near me. Um, but I'm reminded of uh, an event. I think it was back in Kentucky or somewhere where a sinkhole opened up under the floor of the National Corvette Museum. Yeah, I remember that. Yes. That and all sorts of classic Corvettes ended up in this big hole. Yep. 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 Boy, that was that was tough. Were they able to salvage them? I would hope. Not all of them. Yeah, some some places in Kentucky are it's sinkhole country there. Well, I mean, you've got mammoth caves and everything, so that's that's yeah. uh, all kind of goes with the territory, I guess. Mm. A lot well, of limestone formations. But I, I lived in Lexington for a while, and the horse farms around there, there would be, you know, these rolling hills, and then there'd just be this big hole, and oh. they would put a big fence around it to keep the horses from falling. Oh in. gosh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be scary. All right, looks like I've been spotlighted. You have been spotlighted. Or spotlit, I'm not sure which is a, a appropriate. They're, they're calling it, but spotlight. Uh, you've been given a star. Okay, good, one gold star. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Dan, um, I'll be, I'll have my presentation up here. So whenever you're ready, I am ready when you are, sir. <clears throat> okay, okay, let's go. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, nice to see so many of you. And um, this is uh, this is something I did for our local Aries group. I kind of put it together just because I realized there's a lot of information we gather over the years as hams from building and looking at uh, you know looking at catalogs and tearing things apart, and you find a huge variety in. Uh, some of the components that we tend to use and switches of course are are key among them they're they're everywhere i mean from our cars to the house and certainly a lot of our equipment and certainly a lot of the uh equipment interfacing that we do involves switches so i thought i'd just share some of the observations that i've made over the years and uh uh hopefully there's a little something in here that we, you will find useful so let me share my screen
And there we go. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Great. Okay. So let's move on here. I, I, I littered the front with pictures of various switches, some good, some terrible, and uh, some old and some older. <laughs> but uh, we'll go, go through some of these as we go. All right. Now all I have to do is advance it. There we go. Okay, so very, very basically, what's a switch? It's something that makes, breaks, or moves the connection, okay? And the switch can be activated mechanically or electrically. And by mechanical, that would include, uh, you know, uh, wind, you know, pneumatic, uh, hydraulic, uh, as well as manual. And of course, electrical, we're usually talking about relays. A uh, switch can operate on, uh, uh, that is, it can be switching AC, it can be switching DC, or it could be switching RF, which is, goes, of course, real fast AC. And each of those <clears throat> has different requirements, and each of those has uh, different characteristics. So mechanical activation is something you flip, turn, slide, push it by hand, you step on it like a foot switch, uh, a machine moves it like a limit switch, um, uh, or it could be magnetic like intrusion alarms. All these things are switches in different ways to make them uh, do what they do. Mechanical activation, uh, I see a whole variety here. Um, you know, flipping, pushing, stepping. Uh, this is a typical limit switch where some piece will get to this point, hit the roller, and then it'll stop to keep it from going off the end. Uh, <clears throat> you can defeat these switches by clipping around them and have disastrous consequences. Don't ask me how I know but it, inv it involves a prop pitch rotator and a tower <laughs> and many yanked connections. Uh, electrical activation, of course, we're talking about relays and those come in all forms. Up here on the left, of course, this is an uh, automotive solenoid. Uh, it's made to, uh, you know, the, the, to basically put current to the starter motor long enough to get the engine going and then it drops out. Uh, regular frame uh, mechanical relays. This one's got some pretty good size contacts. Uh, many of you have been around for a long time. Maybe you remember the uh, the Dow key uh, relays here that were used uh, sometimes individually, sometimes in pairs for relays for amplifier switching and so on. Uh, you've got little uh, little uh, reed relays. You've got enclosed relays, and then of course you got a lot a whole variety for uh, uh, microwaves and so on. Uh, for AC and DC, uh, the important characteristics you're looking for are first, the rated voltage, and make note that AC and DC will probably be different, their current carrying capacity, uh, their environmental uh, protection, if any, you know, are they explosion proof, weather proof, uh, none of the above. Uh, sequencing, when you switch from A to B, do you not want to make before break or break before make? In other words, do you want to have it... Uh, Disconnect the first one before it goes to the, the other stop, or do you want to have to make sure that it's on all the time? If, for example, you're switching between, uh, let's say you're switching uh, from uh, a AC power supply to a battery, and you don't want the radio to lose power, you would want to make before break. And it always has 12 volts on as you're making that transition, uh, moving from one to the other. Momentary or toggle, okay? Momentary. Uh, it, it's on as long as you hit it. It's like a doorbell and you let go and it stops uh, or toggle where you, you hit it or switch it or whatever. And it's on, it stays there until you, until you do something else to it. Let's look at voltage and current rating. Uh, I just pulled this from uh, a catalog. Uh, this is very typical of some of the switches we use on, you know, we're making panels for, for equipment. Take a look here. What's the rating? 15 amps at 250 volts AC, it'll also handle 15 amps at DC, but only 30 volts. Why do you think that is? Well, anybody ever done any arc welding? What do you do in arc welding? You basically, you draw an arc and you, it, you hold it close enough. It's typically high current, low voltage, and it will sit there and maintain the arc. Well, that can happen in DC too. So remember, alternating current drops to zero 
every half cycle. So the arc is essentially quenched and won't, won't uh, maintain. But direct current maintains that arc as long as the voltage is uh, sufficient to jump the gap. And of course, arcing will damage the contacts um, uh, and, and possibly worse. So the ratings generally are based on uh, construction. Um, for as to current carrying capacity, the real determination there is uh, how big are the what's the cross section area of the contacts and the uh, the the metal and the quality of the contacts. Um, what about voltage? Well, that's where contact spacing uh, comes in. You know, how far away are they? Uh, how much uh, pull apart force is there when you're uh, when you're letting go? Um, and then the housing and maybe encapsulation, all those things may determine uh, what sort of environment it can operate in. <clears throat> you know, you're in a grain silo, you want explosion proof switches because the, that grain powder is, uh, is very uh, combustible. So they have protections like that. Um, here's a typical switch that's rated for, this one's rated for 300 amps continuous. Um, no surprise, this is from a marine uh, environment, uh, but I know hams that use them. They use them in uh, go boxes. They use them at home stations. They're very nice. Uh, look at the size of the studs. Those are three eighths inch studs. Um, big, thick, made for big lugs and big wire. Of course, if you're going to haul that much current, you better have some pretty big wire uh, or it's going to get very hot and, and possibly catch fire. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, this is a switch where you can have everything off. You can use source one, source two, or you can mix them. So you, if you, for example, if you want to go from battery one to battery two or battery one to the, to the uh, AC supply, you'd probably switch it around this way. So that would mean they're both connected and then you go to the other one. So essentially you can, you can choose make before break or break before make based on which direction you turn the switch. Uh, these things are not actually physically that big, typically around three inches across, but I wanted you to see the detail. And uh, again, if you're gonna if you're gonna move a lot of DC, uh, this is a great way to do it. Now compare that with this kind of switch. Uh, you've seen something a little like this in some cheap coax switches. Um, you've seen them uh, in you know on the backs of panels and so on. I used something like this one on the left. Back when I had my 240Z, I threw a switch in there. I broke the brake line and threw a switch in and uh, mounted it right uh, along the uh, center console so that I could hit the brake lights without hitting the brakes if somebody was tailgating me. Um, well, of course, after enough of that, uh, those little contacts started arcing and I realized I didn't have any brake lights at all and I had to replace the switch. So this is back before I knew to look for that sort of thing. Uh, the good thing about these contacts, if any, is that generally because of the uh, these uh, uh, rotors are are moving, they're rotating from one to the other, there's kind of a wiping action, and that wiping action can help keep the contacts clean. Uh, poles and throws. Poles is basically similar switches gang together. Uh, you could have, if you've got enough wafers stacked front to back, you could have an eight or ten pole switch. Uh, the number of throws is the number of different connections you can make. So a single pole double throw, for example, would be one common connection that goes to two different ways. It goes to, say, uh, uh, source A or source B. Uh, double pole single throw would have two commons, uh, each connected or disconnected from its own A. Um, so that's a... Um, you know that those are different configurations, and and you can find or build sets of switches that will do any of those things. Uh, you also have another one, transfer switch, which which we'll discuss later when we're talking about RF switches. Uh, when you get to RF as opposed to AC or DC, uh, you're concerned with a number of things. You're concerned with, of course, with power handling. Uh, you know you don't want to put a uh, you know, a, a switch that can handle, uh, you know, low voltage, low current in the output of your amplifier. Uh, you're concerned with insertion loss. Um, uh, if you have a, you know, how much, how much signal goes away if you have the switch in the system as opposed to having it bypassed. 
uh, isolation, sometimes called crosstalk. Uh, when you have uh, your source connect, you're, when you're connected to source A, how much does the signal bleed through to the B terminal and vice versa? This is particularly important. For example, if you're switching a, uh, let's say a, a moon bounce preamp, okay, you got a preamp up on the tower. And when you're transmitting, you want to make sure that uh, <clears throat> the signal from the other side of the relay is not getting through uh, to the uh, preamp and blowing it up. Uh, usually people do that by using a pair of relays and one switches the uh, the uh, preamp input to a, a, a dummy load, little mini dummy load, and then the other with, with a sequencer, the other one uh, switches to transmit. Uh, but you don't, you know, just because you have a relay that means that the, the, the transmitter is not connected to the preamp doesn't mean that signal can't get through there. And then of course, uh, <clears throat> we're also concerned about not only uh, which connectors are on there, uh, but also how do you mount them? Uh, are they weatherized? And if not, do you have to take some additional steps to uh, protect them from the elements? Power handling, of course, is basically based on two things. It's the, uh, the heat dissipation of the contacts and the connector rating. I had, uh, I had a fellow uh, post on, a, on a, uh, a chat thing that he was, he was building, I guess, uh, he wanted to build up a high power two meter station. He said, I want to find a, uh, a relay that, um, that can handle 1500 watts at two meters, but I want it to have end connectors. And I said, well, you're not really going to find that because anybody who, anybody who designs a commercial switch for 1500 watts is not going to use a connector that's only rated at 800 watts. Okay, so you're gonna you'll probably find uh, DIN connectors or something else. So you're gonna have to basically adapt um, at some point uh, on the other side of that switch. Now that said, um, do you really need something that's rated for 1500 watts continuous? Probably not. Um, a lot of hams who are running 1500 watts on their moon bounce arrays, for example, will use Transco Ys or other. Uh, that are basically rated at seven or 800 watts, but in intermittent amateur service, they do just fine. So you've got uh, SMA connectors, you know, the kind you find on top of your little handhelds these days. Uh, they're good for about 380 watts at two meters. That's the rating. Again, you could probably put more, uh, but not continuous. Uh, now, all these ratings for connectors assume that the uh, standing wave ratio is low and that you're not applying power as you're switching them. In other words, you're not hot switching. Um, generally speaking, relay power ratings tend to be more of an issue at HF where you it's not uncommon to have 1500 watts. Not many people have a kilowatt and a half at two meters or 440, but quite a few have them uh, at HF. So you definitely want to uh, pay attention to the ratings of the switches. Uh, insertion loss, uh, attenuation, isolation, these all vary with frequency. Um, generally speaking, it's not an issue at HF. Um, however, I mean, especially like if you're switching antennas, well, you know, you're not going to be listening at the same time you're transmitting typically on HF. And so, you know, if, if there's some feed through, uh, it won't matter because all you're doing is there may be a minuscule amount of energy going to another antenna, but that's not going to really make a difference to anything. The transmitter won't notice it. You won't notice it. Uh, it's different than having a, uh, a highly sensitive uh, gas fit preamp on the other port, like you might in, a, in a, an EME situation. So uh, all these characteristics are a function of uh, switching geometry and, again, the quality and type of materials that are used in the switch. Um, I've... I happen to have some modest test equipment that allows me to measure this sort of thing for switches and cables. And I will go through a, a, a find at a, at a swap meet or something, and I will sit there and measure the characteristics of these switches. It takes a little while, but um, it's worth doing because sometimes the switch that's nice and shiny has a problem with one of the ports and the switch that looks all beat up is very, very low loss and very reliable. So a good switch, really good switch, 
should have less than one tenth of a dB loss, insertion loss, up at least through our 70 centimeter band. So that's less than 2% of the signal. A poor switch can have a dB and a half of loss or more. That's like a third of your signal. Um, and, you know, the, if, if the switch is a, has a tinny feel to it, um, if there's not much uh, force to go from, you know, position A to position B, if, the, uh, if it's all shiny and chromey uh, and the connectors are, you know, kind of riveted in or pressed in, yeah, you may want to reconsider that or at least measure it before you use it. Uh, isolation. Um, more isolation is generally better. We talked earlier about having a, 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 this, your transmitted signal leaking through to your preamp on the other side of the, of the relay. You definitely don't want that. A good switch, um, and I, you, I look at the graphs of these things, the guaranteed performance is typically 80 dB or better down at 450 megahertz. That's like for every 100 watts, that's one microwatt. So that's that's pretty good. That's really good. And that's their guaranteed minimum. Typical performance is even better. A poor switch, uh, such as one that uh, a friend gave me, said, I'm going to give this to a, low, uh, a new ham. I, I looked at that thing and I kind of grunted and I looked at it again. I'm going to put this thing on my tester. At, at uh, 450 megahertz, there was 13 dB of, uh, only 13 dB of isolation. That means uh, for every 100 watts, you got about five watts going into the other port. Uh, not very good. Not very good. And, and I suspect other characteristics of that switch, uh, including longevity and so on, are probably similarly poor. Now, uh, coax relays come in a number of configurations. The most common um, differentiator is latching or fail-safe. Well, a latching relay, just like it sounds, uh, when you switch to A, it stays there even if you no longer are pushing the button or hold or have or energizing the relay. Uh, so it just takes a pulse of energy to move that relay to position A, and then it stays there. Um, uh, Fail-safe relay, um, on the other hand, will switch to position A until you let go and then or turn the energy at power off, and then it goes to back to its original position. You usually see those positions labeled normally closed. That's that's where it's unenergized and normally open. Uh, latching relays, because they hold the position, you don't really have a normally closed. Uh, it's whichever the last one was energized was closed. Also with latching relays, uh, often you'll be able to tell by looking at the uh, pinouts, assuming it uses a like uh, you know lugs or something on the on the back of it, um, you'll typically have extra. If, if you've got a two position relay, uh, you'd expect well you got a got a you know a new you know a common an A and a B um, that you you send power to, but they'll often have another set of contacts and uh, you know maybe several sets of contacts. Those are typically used for an indicator because unlike a, a fail safe relay where I know I know the relays in, in you know transmit as long as I'm pushing the button, then I let go, it's back and receive. Well, a latching relay, since you know you may not remember where you last set it. So having an indicator there can help remind you. So often when you look at the relay and you see a whole bunch of those uh, extra lugs, that usually means it's a uh, it's a latching relay. Now, just because it has multiple positions doesn't mean it's a latching relay. Uh, very commonly. You'll have uh, maybe a single pole, four throw or six throw or 10 throw, uh, particularly in the microwave area. And um, there's no indicator at all. That's because it's really a fail safe relay. You can choose any of several positions, but when the power goes out or you let go of the uh, actuator, whatever it is, um, it will always return to where none of the contacts are connected. Here's a typical, you know, uh, two position, single pole, two position. Um, these, I believe, tend to have kind of the wafer switches in them, maybe good wafer switches, but wafer nonetheless. Uh, here's alpha delta with a uh, common in the middle 
and then it's a four position. Uh, this one I think has uh, has uh, uh, lightning suppressors in it. Oops, let me go back. And then this is a very for for UHF and microwave guys. This is very common. This is a basically a transco um, little. Um, it's very small. It's about an inch and a half across. Uh, these are SMA connections, and they almost always run on 24, 28 volts nominal, which is to say uh, anything from 18 to 20 volts on is usually good. And uh, these things are ubiquitous. I have I have at least four or five of them in my uh, in my microwave box where I switch from one band to another. Uh, these act basically as TR relays, uh, switching the antenna from the receive port of the transverter to the transmit port of the transverter. Uh, they're used everywhere. Um, again, the physical condition of them may or may not be indicative of their electrical condition. I always test them, and I always segregate out the ones that have a problem of one sort or another. Um, here's that old Dow key I mentioned, but in a double pull, double throw configuration. Okay, so you've got here's here's a double double throw relay. Okay, it goes this connection goes between here and here, but then on the other side. It's got a twin over here that goes from the hidden one down there to the hidden one up there. And this is particularly useful in switching uh, the an amplifier that doesn't have a built-in, um, you know, built-in switching. Um, so normally when you're transmitting, you want the amplifier to go, uh, you know, the amplifier input to go into the input of the amplifier as opposed to somewhere else. And then when you're receiving, you typically have a, a, a connection here, a bridge here, a little jumper, and that will take the signal out to the, uh, uh, to the antenna. So you're not trying to receive backwards through the amplifier. Uh, so that's a very, very typical con uh, configuration, certainly in older amplifiers. A lot of them now, of course, use you know pin diode and other switching which is quieter and, and probably more reliable. Transfer switches are a unique uh, item and uh, they can be used in a number of ways. Uh, basically, there are only two positions in a transfer switch. Uh, typically also, they're, they're, they can be latching or fail safe. Uh, these are fail safe where, where there's no power, uh, Upper left is connected to upper right, lower left is connected to lower right. But when you put power on it, this one switches down to here, and then this one switches up to here. So now instead of having, let's say, the transmitter and the antenna there, now the, tra uh, the, uh, the radio goes to, let's say, the output of a preamp, and the antenna goes to the input of a preamp. And so you can basically uh, put something into or out of a circuit. Could be a, a preamp, an amplifier, a filter, any number of things. Uh, just by hitting one switch, by activating that relay, that transfer relay, you can you can basically uh, immediately. It's instead of hooking and unhooking something, you can say, okay, it's in the circuit or it's completely bypassed. And these come not just in SMA; they come in big. Uh, you know, type in and, and UA, mostly type in. You don't see that many of these commercial switches using UHF connectors because it really isn't a, a standard in the industry. So uh, <clears throat> oftentimes I just make up the cables using the proper connectors. Or uh, if if you're in a pinch, you can use adapters. And I've got plenty of those. And I uh, hate to say it, but some of them have been temporarily in my station for several years, let's say. Um, Thought I'd show you the guts of one particularly good switch. This is a Transco, um, it's called a 1460, and it's very, very well built. That's It uses a spring-loading actuator here. So it's there's a lot of turn force to it. You know, you, you it takes a, a, a bit to turn it, but it goes ka-chunk, ka-chunk, and that each ka-chunk takes one of those contacts and pushes it against this contact with a good amount of force. Um, these things will, they're maintainable and they go forever and they can handle the power 
as much certainly as much power as the connectors allow and often beyond. Um, you have to consider ergonomics. I mentioned a, uh, I mentioned the high activation force that's required from those transco switches. Uh, <clears throat> I actually, I could probably go in and, and loosen the spring tension a little bit, but what I did instead was I, uh, I took the, uh, the uh, knob, uh, cut out a shape of that in a big block of wood, put a few little knurls around it, and I slip that over, and that gives me a lot more leverage because it's a you know it's a three inch knob instead of a one inch knob. But first, think about convenient placement of the switch. Uh, if it's something you're going to use frequently, you shouldn't have to you know reach up over the back of a over the back of a shelf or something uh, to activate it. Even though it may be convenient to mount it there, it's not convenient to use it there. So think about placement. Uh, again, appropriate activation force. If it's something that's not going to be used often and uh, you've got good grip strength or a little uh, cheat tool like I made, uh, then maybe that high activation force switch is fine. If you've got something that's going to be used in mobile or it's going to be knocked around or in portable use, you probably don't want a switch that flips at the you know touch of a finger. Uh, you want it to stay put. Uh, so you want to avoid accidental activation, and that can be a function of both activation force and placement. Um, foot switches, you know, uh, you can you can have them at a, a fixed spot in your uh, under your operating desk. I use foot switches all the time on my HF operations um, when I'm running nets and so on. It allows me to uh, definitively control when I'm on the air and when I'm not. I don't like voice operated transmit uh, certain things you may utter in frustration, go out on the air and you didn't want them to ask me how I know. And a word about hot switching, which is switching while the power is on. That's the word. Don't do it. That There are a few relays, uh, like some of the Jennings uh, RJ series vacuum relays that have a special coatings on the contacts and they can handle some hot switching but most switches you can't do that without starting to damage the things especially if you're running fairly high power if you're if you're putting a handheld power through a big transco switch or relay no big deal but if you're running you know 500 600 watts uh you probably want to do that it's gonna you know it, it could cause some arcing and Remember, there's, there's a period of time in most of these switches where nothing's going to be connected. And if you've got your transmitter going and for an instant, it's sitting there running into a, an infinite load, if you will, you know, um, you could damage the radio. So uh, try to make sure that however you design these things, uh, you, don't, you don't end up hot switching or you try to eliminate the possibility of hot switching altogether. So with that... Let's go for some questions. I stunned everybody. <laughs> Anything in here that you didn't know before? Well, Tom had a question. He wanted to know when you were talking about latching. Yes. Is it mechan mechanical latching or electrical latching? Uh, good question. Generally, uh, generally it's electrical latching, and sometimes they use a, a some sort of magnetic situation inside to help hold it. Uh, in other words, the magnet's not strong enough to keep it there uh, if if the coil is pulling the actuator in the other direction. Um, but uh, usually it's 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 a some sort of, there's some there may be some mechanical but often it's magnetic inside especially for the microwave relays and again it, you know if it's latching you don't need power you know you could you could pull all the power off it and unplug the control cables and it'll st still sit there in the last position you were so there's definitely it's not electric And what about QSK? QSK, okay, fast break in. Um, those, you know, there you are typically 
generally hot switching. And and now some amplifiers I know have uh, a uh, a delay built in, but when you're QSK, that tip that delay is typically almost non-existent. Uh, normally, there you will not use mechanical switches. Uh, you would use uh, pin diodes or some other electronic switching um, for that because you're you know you maybe if you're especially if you're a QRQ guy you're going you're going fast you know 45 50 words a minute uh, and to be able to hear between dits uh, that switching has to be almost instantaneous I mean microseconds not milliseconds you might quickly explain uh, what uh, Q, uh, QSK means QRK means. okay yeah yeah break in means uh, <clears throat> if uh when you're when you're sending um uh, and typically you don't use this on voice this is this is mainly for cw <laughs> um you're sending a string of dits okay there are you usually have two options one is uh you hold either using vox or your foot switch you hold the the, the radio and transmit position as long as you're sending and then when you stop sending you let up or the vox disconnects after a little delay uh, in in uh, QSK uh, or fast break in, uh, the radio goes back to receive every time it's not transmitting, which is between the dits. So if you're going did 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 did, you're hearing the receiver's coming back. The purpose of that is so that you can hear if the other station wants to break in and stop you in the middle of your transmission. You know, if you're stepping on the foot switch and sending for five minutes. Uh, you can't tell whether something's happening or the other person wants to stop you or something else is going on. Uh, with fast break-in, you can always hear if they want to break in. Uh, the old CW traffic operators used to use this a lot. It's it's less common these days, but some contest operators use it. Michelle wants to know why are microwave switches and relays so expensive? <laughs> uh, because of who buys them. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're not made for the cheap ham market. They're, they're made for industry where they've got big budgets, often government money. And, uh, I mean, if you've looked at anything bought by a government, you, you, you know, that, you know, the old $600 hammer thing is absolutely true. Um, uh, and also, uh, often if, especially if it's, if it's mil spec, um, they have to go through a bunch of testing. Okay. Now it may not cost. You know, if your switch is, runs at $700, it may not cost $700 to build the switch and make a little profit and send it out to you. But by the time you go through the environmental testing, the drop test, the temperature test, the salt spray, all the other, all the other things they have to do and certify it and uh, allow for uh, the possibility that one of them will fail under the, under the warranty, um, that's where a lot of the cost comes in. It's, it's, uh, and certainly in the design as well to make sure that it meets those original specifications. Um, but that said, uh, I don't, I have almost never bought a good switch new. Um, I find them uh, swap meets on the internet. And usually I'll look at the reputation because I mean, some of these things can be junk and I've had some that are junk, but even though they look good, um, but most of them, have performed quite well. And once I run through the testing, I know what they'll do. Uh, they may have had, you know, they're rated, typically they may be rated for, you know, 1 million activations and maybe they've had half a million. Well, you know, I can, I can live with that. That's just fine. You don't know how many activations they've had, but if you see good, clean changeover on your, on your scope or whatever you're looking at between, uh, you know, switching modes in the, in the switch, um, you're probably fine. And if the insertion loss is low, that means the contacts are clean. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've had, I've had very expensive switches that I've been able to pick up for as little as 10 bucks. But yeah, good, Dan, good question. Dan in California wants to know what are those noisy relays in LDG antenna tune is doing, if not hot switching? <laughs> Okay, well, LDG, uh, any antenna tune, any automatic antenna tuner is basically, it's a set of fixed capacitors and a set of fixed inductors. And what it's doing is searching different combinations, excuse me, for the, uh, the uh, best match. 
and it may have to go through, you know, if you've got a bank of 12 capacitors and 12 inductors, it may have to go through 100 and some combinations before it finds the right one. So it's not chattering. What it's doing is quickly trying each of those combinations and starting to narrow it down. How long it takes to do that depends on the logic in the, uh, in the uh, you know, built into the thing. But the, uh, all automatic antenna tuners typically, except the ones that use, you know, rotary and, and measurements of, uh, you know, measurements of current and so on, you know, where they have uh, motor driven vacuum variables and so on. Most of them are uh, switched fixed value capacitors and inductors. And again, they're just, it's clicking around. And many of them, they have, they will memorize it so that next time they see that frequency, they remember which combination worked with that antenna and you'll find they'll go there very quickly and you won't have all that clattering. My only point was that they got 10 watts of current going through them. Well, usually when you tune them, you're tuning at a lower than the, uh, than the maximum power. Um, 10 watts. Uh, hmm? the, the, all of LDG's auto tuners will reduce the power to 10 watts while they're doing a tune. Okay, and for good reason. They don't want to hot switch more power than they can handle. But uh, again, they've, they've got to search. They have to try maybe 100 or more combinations to find where's the lowest. And every, every single combination involves at least two relays going off and two relays going on. So that's where all yeah. the clickings come from. That, that four port alpha delta switch you showed, yeah, it's a tank of a switch, and that um, bronze colored screw thing in the center yep. was a lightning arrestor that will blow. Um, I've seen one do it in 25 years, and that was the one that I had power going to an MFJ multi band HF radio that had flames coming out of every one of its pieces. Oh, after. A lightning came up from the ground that it was, uh, I didn't cement it in. I just had it uh, stuck down in a deep hole. And I took it apart to find out what got burnt and nothing got burnt. I just reassembled it and it worked like it Those always Those gas did. discharge things are very, very fast. And uh, I mean, lightning operates in the order of, you know, uh, less than a millisecond. You can have a lot of current. So those things have to blow very fast. So that's good to know. Uh, their, their reputation is very good on those things. The problem with those, they're tiny little things and they're not very, they're nine or 10 bucks each, but you store one for 20 years and you're never going to find it. Oh, you put it in a safe place. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it on the side. I have, I, I remember many things that I put in a safe place and no, I still I, wonder I, where I, they I are. I take apart another pile saying it'll be safe under here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> for, for small, <laughs> oh God. I yeah, <laughs> uh, for you know, for for small parts like that that go with something specific, if you can find them anymore, uh, the old uh, film canisters are really good. I, I keep a spare relay for my alf, old Alpha amp, and I keep uh, the uh, screws to screw in the uh, the transformer for for uh, when you're moving it around and so on. So there are. Um, you know, there are little storage ways like that. If you if you get some medications, little pill bottles, uh, you know, keep the things in there, maybe pack some foam in it or something if it's sensitive, and then uh, put a label on the outside and, and have it in with your spare parts, and then it's going to be easier to find. Labeling and indexing stuff is an art form that some of us hope other people will do on our behalf. <laughs> yeah, well, when I'm dead, they're not going to care about it. They're just going to get rid of it, so... But yeah, uh, you know, especially if if they're unique to one particular piece of equipment, you know, label it label it for that. Same for fuses, by the way. I mean, we think, oh, we got this whole collection of fuses. But if something blows and you need to get back on, it'll take you hours to find the right one, unless you've already pulled them out and said, here are the fuses for running this amplifier on one ten. Here are the fuses for running this amp on two twenty, uh, and so on. Uh, Here's the, here's the fuse for this solid state UHF amp. Um, and if you have them either that, or if you can find room and put a mount a clip maybe inside the unit and have the, uh, have the spare fuse actually tucked in there in a, in a unconnected clip, that's another way to keep it handy. But uh, yeah, for something like this, 
um, you certainly don't want it rattling around inside the switch. So some sort of uh, a tube or container, that kind of a medication, you know, pill size container uh, that's properly labeled is probably the best way to go. Okay. What is a ceiling relay? I'm sorry? What is a ceiling? S-E-A-L-I-N-G relay. F-E-A-L-I-N-G? S. F like a ceiling. Ceiling. Yeah. Seal, as in Our talking. Person. Stealing. Yeah. Um, Tom wants to know that. I don't know. Probably a, uh, I mean, I presume it's one that is, uh, has environmental, you know, environmental uh, enclosure type stuff on it. Hey, Tom, you want to come on and uh, explain a little bit more? Yeah, maybe I'm missing something here. Hey, Tom. Yeah, it, you know, in the electrical craft where the language is often really different from what people in electronics and engineering would use, a ceiling relay is one of the poles on the relay is dedicated to powering the coil. So the moment I energize it, um, it, it will stay energized until I deliberately break the seal on the energizing contact. In other words, I have to de-energize it deliberately once I've energized it, because it'll supply itself. So it's a kind of latching relay. Right, but an electric latching relay. Uh, elect I electrical if it, for power. I was, it, I was wondering if it has an equivalent name in electronics that I would know nothing about, uh, because you know that's not what I dealt with. Yeah, yeah I, no, I would call it a latching relay in, in the electronic equivalent. Thank you. Okay, and Dave? From Michigan wants to know if you test ham fast finds in the flea market with some portable testing jig. I don't bring my portable stuff to test it. I kind of go on the reputation of the seller. Uh, if it's somebody I've dealt with before, if it's somebody I know, part of a club that I know, uh, then I'll usually, I may take a chance on it. You know, I've got enough. I don't need them that often, but if I find something that looks like a decent deal and I check the reputation, um, I'll go ahead and give it a try and maybe get the guy's contact info. And frankly, if you get a dud, uh, I've had people say, okay, you know, that's fine. Just, you know, they'll, they'll take off the, you know, give me a partial rebate or something like that. Um, but I mean, obviously you're, it's like buying any used equipment. Uh, you know, it's, it's up to the buyer to make sure that it's appropriate for what they want and uh, to ask the appropriate questions. You know, you can ask, you know, did this come out of active service uh, or is this something you picked up at the last swap meet last weekend? Uh, do you know the history of it? That can that can give you some idea. You know, people who work in, in the air, in the aerospace industry in particular, uh, you may find new spares, you know, things they had and and uh, maybe the program got shut down and they they scooped up the things that were going to get tossed. And those are often really good deals. They're very nice and often uh, either lightly used or unused. Very funny, Tom. Tom made a comment. It says, you guys know that you were supposed to get a permit from the Mine Safety and Health Administration for searching your shack. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know about mines, but... Uh, uh, OSHA would probably come and hit me upside the head once in a while. But not for climbing gear. I do use proper climbing gear. They uh, they do per permits for open pit mining, too. So you don't have to be going all the way underneath with shoring. Okay, well, I'll send them over to our sinkhole. <laughs> the famous Chatsworth sinkhole. Anything else? If someone wants, what do they mean when they say contacts are self-cleaning? Self-cleaning usually means there's some sort of wiping action. If you think of a contact as just going on and off like this, you know, they connect and pulled away apart from each other. There's really, there's no wiping action there. But if you think of a, like those, um, those rotary switches I showed you earlier, where it, it switches into this contact and then it switches down to this contact. Every time it moves, it's wiping that surface. And, uh, and so that, 
that kind of tends to keep the oxidation from building up. Do you have any idea what you just said in sign language? <laughs> no, and I don't want to. <laughs> I'm going to keep this simple, folks. <laughs> simple and civil. <laughs> That's all the questions in chat, Dan. Okay. I don't see hands up. I know these guys aren't bashful. Okay. Thanks, Barry. It's, yeah. Thank you, Barry. It's a great presentation. Well done. Well, I, I just don't see this sort of thing out there in any sort of training. So I thought, heck, let's just pull some of it together and see what sticks to the wall. So I'm glad you found it interesting. This stuff qualifies as Elmer's secrets. <laughs> okay. The old timers who dealt with either building their own stuff or uh, modifying their own stuff often ran into this stuff years ago with the switches and such and learned things the hard way. Um, and it's very knowledgeable. The new folks now, they don't, it's something like this. I can understand why they want to know about the swiping and the, all these kind of things because they, they're just not part of our day to day world anymore. Well, you know, even even if they're even if they're assembling their own station uh, with commercially made equipment, they should be in a position to at least, you know, do a kind of a sanity check on does it make sense to use this kind of device in this kind of application. Well, so much stuff is getting smaller and smaller and smaller logarithmically for solid state actuation. Uh, so I got that. And robotics. Oh, yeah. I, I always have at least one magnifying glass uh, within reach on my body and another better <laughs> one within reach at an arm's length. Okay. But you still can't see it. Victor's got his hand up. Yay, Victor. You got your hand up. Hey, there. Victor. Go ahead. Victor, go ahead and unmute. There we my, go. My space, my space bar failed. My space bar switch failed me. Uh oh, that's uh, okay. Didn't unmute me when I wanted it to. Um, and speaking of fail safe, uh, do we use many switches with lights in them? I, I remember as a civilian working on the airbase, we had uh, test switches. I guess they were called test switches, but they were red and green lights, and you'd press on them and they'd change color, and you'd know that that circuit was working or. I remember what they were doing with them, but uh, it wasn't until tonight that I really understood that those were fail-safe. I well, never had a name for them. I, they, they may not. They may not be. Uh, again, fail-safe has to do with whether it stays in the it, it stays in the second position. It doesn't fall back to the first one. Like uh, if if you were to uh, if you were to take your rotator. If you were to take your rotator, and, and the indicator is a whole separate thing, but if you were to take your rotator and uh, say, uh, turn it clockwise and just leave it on and put a brick on it, okay? Uh, if there wasn't a stop switch inside the rotator, it would just keep twisting until the coax is twisted apart. Uh, that uh, fail safe means uh, when you, you know, when you let go, it, it won't, it, you won't forget and leave it in an engaged position when you never intended to. Uh, you know, you don't want a brick on your push to talk switch, and then you're wondering where everybody went because you can't hear them anymore. So that's fail safe. The, the indicator switches, they're nice. Uh, you don't see them very often in amateur use, uh, but you do see them occasionally in commercial use and certainly in the, in the power area where uh, if it's engaged, it's one color. If it's, uh, if it's disengaged, it's another. Or if it's, it's lit, if it's on, and it's not lit, if it's off, something like that. Those are really nice if you find some and uh, and you find that's a that's a useful thing for you. Uh, again, indicators generally are for uh, latching situations because you know if you're holding the button down or you're stepping on the foot switch, but you don't know if it may not know if you pushed this button into position B five minutes ago and then let go. It's still sitting there in that position. Um, and so those indicator lights are generally, other than just to tell you the circuit is live, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, you know things that change color or or light with uh, with switching mode um, generally are um, 
latching type of switches uh, because otherwise you might forget where you left, what position you left that switch in. All right, thank you. Sure. Also, uh, isolation switches where they use LED lights and stuff like that. That's a whole different, that's not an indicator thing, but it's a, a, another way they use that. Yeah, as I say, if you, if you can find some that are configured the way you want and they and the, the lighting works, uh, it's a nice touch and it certainly certainly makes things look a little classier. Okay. But yeah, think think on your on your transceiver. You know, you've got the uh in some transceivers, if you push the uh, uh noise blanker button, a little LED in the middle of the button will come on, reminding you that it's there. Not everybody does that. Some it's a it's a front panel item or something else, but there are some radios where if you engage a function, um, that will stay lit until you disengage it. Yes, because they're real handy on these these newer radios where you got a jillion things you can do with it. Okay, okay. more hands, more questions. Don't let him off the hook easy, folks. <laughs> Okay, Tom's got his hand up. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, I just, you keep saying fail safe in, in an electrician's world, which is where I come from. The other half of that is fail secure, and it mostly has to do with solenoid locks and, and things like that, where if, if you need them to fail secure because it's a prison cell, uh, then you, you release the electricity, it stays secure. You have okay. to re-engage the electricity, reverse the polarity or something to get it to disengage. So lot, that's basically like a normally closed. <laughs> well, it, yeah, normally closed for the for the bar it's controlling. The bar, it. yeah. So, um, and then fail secure means that it'll return to the open position anytime it loses power. Right. Whether that's, whether that's good for the facility or not, it'll let you out of there. <laughs> okay. It's just... A different yeah. usage. Yeah, I wasn't of the term. familiar with that terminology, but that makes sense. It's just a different usage of the term, and and uh, they used to beat it into our heads regularly in fire and rescue training that we had to be aware of that because you go past a certain door and it wants to <clears throat> fail secure behind you. This is not a good thing. <laughs> I remember uh, during the Sayer fire, um, uh, another uh, Aries member and I were the ones deployed at three in the morning to go and reestablish communications because they'd lost everything uh, at uh, all of you hospital and uh, they, they couldn't no longer talk to the medical alert center. So um, <clears throat> another ham and I uh, arrived from different directions and we got into the hospital and there was a set of glass doors. And I thought, Oh boy. Uh, I said, let's wait. I'm going to stay out here. You go through the door and then see if you can come back out. Uh, and once we determined that they weren't locking us in, then we went in and we did that with every set of doors we encountered. Good plan. Yeah. I was well, you know, you envision the worst case and <laughs> if you don't plan for it, it might happen. Okay, anything else? Yeah, anything else, folks? You let him off easy tonight, guys. Can't do that. We wanted to come back and do Boy, we got to, we got to stretch a half hour presentation to almost an hour. Yeah, it's been good. It's a good presentation. Well done. I like the graphics. Okay, uh, any comments out there? Yes, electronics get smaller. It makes it even more difficult. Yes, the thing about us old guys, so to speak, you got to see it happen. You can take the things apart and watch the switching going on and such. With the new solid state stuff and the really tiny stuff, uh, you, you just gotta, you can't even visualize. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing to see. Yeah. Uh, I've, but when I've had uh, like microwave relays, the ones that don't pass the test and fail or they have, you know, actuation problem or something, <clears throat> I'll usually open them up. I mean, they're, they're now my, they're now my uh, guinea pig. I can open up and see how they actually work or how they're supposed to work. So just because something's broken doesn't mean you throw it away. You open it up and use it for a learning opportunity. Okay. All right, I guess that's it. No, Victor's got his hand. Oh, Victor, yes. 
Because this is it, yes. Uh, for those of us on the West Coast, and I know Marty's one of them, uh, today is a very, very special day. I think we can consider it a switch. Um, the uh, Wanda Fuqua Fault, which has been switched to a locked position for 326 years now, tonight, uh, may it hold for another 326 years. May they not flip that switch and let that earthquake go. It'd be very, very nice. Uh, it's on the emergency management side of all these switches. Thank you very much. Have a great week. All right. Thank you, Victor. Okay, Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes. We're going to start wrapping this up a couple of minutes early this tonight. Sometimes Earl, is your hand up or is that just part of your logo? KD4IE? I see a hand next to your picture, and I'm not sure if you're you have a question or not. Guess not. As far as video, it's not not. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I have a hand up. <laughs> I don't see it. Okay, well, it was off to the side of your picture. Okay, we done. We look like we are done. Gonna wrap. All righty. Well, thank you, folks, for hanging in there. Yes. See you all next Wednesday for another exciting adventure here. Yes, indeed. Best regards, all hands. <laughs> Good night, all. All right. Thank you, all. Take care. 73s. Good night.